Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Coney Island. In appreciation of your season's patronage, we are happy once again to present our annual fireworks display. All good things must come to an end. So after 85 years of successful operation, Coney Island will close with tonight's operation, September the 6th, 1971. Coney Island has played a part in the lives of several generations. The good times you've enjoyed here and the memories will last a lifetime. Now we must look to the future, a new park, a new home, King's Island. I promise you it will be more than you could ever dream an amusement park could offer. And now it is time for our final and farewell salute to Coney Island. Now, Mr. Rossi, on with the fireworks. Few amusement parks captured the hearts of so many, as did Cincinnati's Coney Island. And it certainly captured my heart, too. Many, many years ago, as a Marine on leave in Cincinnati, I was talked into yet another boat ride to hit another island. The boat, the island queen, the island, Coney Island. A lot of fun, a lot of excitement, a lot of thrills for every member of the entire family. Ah, but there was romance, too. Mm, remember it well. Seems like a hundred years ago, of course, by now. But there was Moonlight Gardens, and the sound of the big bands, dancing, Lake Como. It all added up to a beautiful day. What it really adds up to, though, is some really great memories. Coney Island's closing was really unique in the entertainment industry. Attendance was at its highest, and the park was enjoying the peak of its success. Coney was sold by its owners to the Taft Broadcasting Company of Cincinnati in 1969. And a phase out of the park began while Taft and Coney management made plans to build a multi-million dollar theme park just north of the city. 1971 was the last year Coney Island operated as an amusement park in Cincinnati. Now the reasons for closing are really clear. Lack of room to expand, a cramped location, inadequate parking facilities, and yearly flooding from the Ohio River combined to force that decision. It all started here, in a small apple orchard occupying 20 acres of land on this shady bank of the Ohio River. In the 1870s, James Parker, then owner of this grove, began renting his orchard to picnickers and soon it became a popular spot for outings. An industrious Mr. Parker quickly realized that more money was to be made by renting the orchard than by raising apples. As the apple trees died from neglect, they were replaced with maples and amusements, such as a bowling alley and a dance platform. 
Parker sold the grove to Captain William McIntyre, who rebuilt the park and opened it to the public on June 21st, 1886 as Ohio Grove, Coney Island of the West. Within a short time, the name Ohio Grove was forgotten and the park was simply known as Coney Island. During the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th, ownership of Coney changed hands several times. Additional land was purchased to increase the acreage to 120 acres. Now, fortunately, the park policy that everything was to be first class remained with each new owner. Now, in comparison, New York's Coney Island was exceedingly gaudy, not to mention dangerous. This film, shot in 1905, shows amusements typical of the day. Although the names were the same, New York's Coney and Cincinnati were unrelated and totally separate. Even with Coney's safe atmosphere and family entertainment, the park struggled through the first 40 years of its existence. In fact, it was Chester Park, Cincinnati's other amusement park, that was enjoying success during the teens. Now, all this changed in 1924 when Coney was bought by a group of Cincinnati merchants. Most of the park was demolished, and with the expenditure of $1 million, Coney Island was completely modernized. It was during this time that Coney was first known as America's finest amusement park, a title deservedly earned and used with pride. As before the redevelopment, picnicking was still a major part of any visit to Coney. Picnic tables were scattered throughout the grove beneath the towering shade trees, and large shelter pavilions provided a place to partake of your picnic lunch without the threat of rainy weather. Rides are one of the major attractions of any amusement park, and Coney Island was no different. The park's variety of rides thrilled even the most selective park patron. Most of the major rides were located around the mall, Coney's combination floral garden and midway. The east end of the mall was the location of the two most popular rides. The Wildcat, which debuted in 1926, quickly established itself as Coney's most celebrated ride. And the Cascades, a new version of the traditional Tunnel of Love, which opened two years later in 1928. Like the Wildcat, the Cascades also quickly became a park favorite. The Ferris wheel and airplane swings held locations on the opposite end of the mall. Both were features of the park until their removal in 1969. This ride, the Zoomer, headed up the amusements along the south side. One of the more unique rides at the park, the Zoomer gave riders a journey to the river and back in a plane actually driven by a small propeller. Mr. 
plastic chutes. Coney's older mill chute ride sat between the Zoomer and another interesting innovation, the Twister, the world's first completely tunneled roller coaster. The park's carousel, tumblebug, and greyhound coaster led to Bluebeard's Palace, Coney's haunted house of sorts. Two huge heads resembling large coconuts loomed ominously in the rear of the mall. Built for the 1927 season, this walkthrough dark ride offered tilted rooms, hidden air jets, moving floors, and other amusing diversions. The Jack and Jill was located on the north side of the mall near the roller skating pavilion. Several accidents on this ride caused its removal after only a few seasons. Years later, the park management was still remarking that buying this ride was indeed a mistake. The Devil's Kitchen, a second walk through Dark Ride, disoriented patrons as they tried to gracefully stroll through winding passageways within a slowly rocking structure. Other attractions near the mall included the park's game building, a cafeteria, and the Moonlight Gardens Dance Hall. What attraction held the widest appeal? Sunlight Pool, of course, uh, then called the Natatorium. Built in 1925 as part of the redevelopment program, the pool earned the title of America's largest recirculating water pool. Measuring 200 by 401 feet, the pool has a water capacity of 3 million gallons. At one time, a white sand beach covered the lawn west of the pool. This practice was discontinued, however, when health officials deemed it unsanitary. Under the direction of general manager George Schott and his son Edward, Coney flourished into one of this country's best amusement parks. Chester Park was no match for this new Coney Island. Soon, everyone was going to Coney. Little change occurred during the period 1930 to 1936. Building facades remained basically the same, and the only notable change was the addition of Coney's Kitty Land, the land of Oz. Ed Schott became general manager after his father's death in 1935. Schott, then 28, became the youngest operator of a major amusement park. The position of general manager would continue in the same family with the appointment of Ralph Walks, son-in-law to George Schott after Edward's death in 1962. One event was to change the entire look of Coney. The devastating 1937 Ohio River flood left $300,000 worth of damage in its wake. Coney was used to the river's yearly flooding but none before had ever matched the force of the near 80-foot crest. This flood gauge, erected by the folks here at Coney, gives visitors to the park some idea of the floods that occurred here. But these pictures, however, tell the story of one particular spring in 1937. When the water receded in February of that year, the magnitude of the flood was apparent. While many of the structures, such as the Wildcat, Auto Gate, and Games Building escaped still standing, others weren't so lucky. The cafeteria, pool building, and grove pavilions collapsed, and the once beautiful mall was turned into a junkyard of debris. The decision to rebuild from the ruins was a bold move by the park management and work began almost immediately. With the odds against them,
Coney was able to open up on time in May of 1937. Only the opening of the newly built cafeteria was delayed. The new sensation for the season was the Clipper, a coaster to send a chill through even the most seasoned coaster rider. <laughs> Many of the new structures were designed in the Art Deco style, typical of the 30s. The clubhouse, cafeteria, exhibition hall, and most of the other building facades reflected the smooth lines and curves of the Art Deco era. The music of the big band era was heard on the dance floors of Moonlight Gardens and Coney's Island Queen. The recording you hear is an actual performance of Clyde Trask and his orchestra aboard the Island Queen in 1938. As before the flood, good times once again reigned at Coney Island. The devastation had not been able to destroy Coney's charm and beauty. In fact, ironically, it had helped to enhance it. Many outings were taken as part of a community day. Most Cincinnati area communities sponsored days at the park, and they invited their residents to enjoy Coney Island. Now, in addition to picnicking and riding the rides, many special events and contests were planned. On this day in 1940, residents of Westwood and Cheviot were treated to the sights and sounds of America's finest amusement park. This rare footage gives a look back in time to the days when the Island Queen glided gracefully upstream, delivering thousands to a summertime paradise.
Steamboats played an important part in the development and growth of Coney Island. In all, 19 boats made the 10-mile journey between Cincinnati's public landing and the park over a 60-year period. Of these 19 steamboats, the Island Queen was undisputed champion. She was, in fact, the second steamer to carry that name in the Coney Island trade, the first having burned in an off-season fire in 1922. The second queen was placed into service in 1925, boasting glass-enclosed decks and the largest ballroom afloat. The Island Queen was the finest steamer around. For many years, the coming of spring was not gauged by the first robin, but by the awakening of the Island Queen after her winter nap. thirties, when people had the choice of riding to Coney aboard the Queen or the smaller Island Maid, most picked the Queen. The Island Maid operated in the shadow of her larger sister until she burned in 1932. World War II saw local officials trying to shut down the Queen, saying she burned oil badly needed for the war effort. And not satisfied with this, the park management sent a letter to Washington regarding the matter. The reply came back that the Island Queen was very much a part of the war effort as she boosted morale in the area. In river towns from Pittsburgh to New Orleans, the Island Queen was a welcome visitor with an invitation to romance. It was on one of these trips to Pittsburgh that the Queen's calliope fell silent forever. On September the 9th, 1947, a stray spark from a welder's torch ignited 30,000 gallons of fuel oil. The resulting explosion rocked the Monongahela waterfront, shattering windows two blocks away. In a few hours, the Queen slowly sank. In all, 19 lost their lives in the blast, 20 if you count the Island Queen herself. In Cincinnati, the news was met with shock and disbelief. A part of the city's pride and joy disappeared that day. Her loss has never been regained. The loss of the Island Queen signaled the beginning of Coney's parking problems. With the Queen, 3,000 people could be easily transported in one trip. Now their cars jammed Coney's lots, as well as the inadequate access roads from Cincinnati. But the death of the Island Queen did not mean the end of romance at Coney Island. Since its opening in 1925, Moonlight Gardens entertained millions. Originally built as an open-air dance platform, Moonlight was given a roof for the 1928 season, and Cincinnati soon found itself involved in a love affair with Moonlight.
Music flowed from the band shell as many of America's leading bands made stops at the park. Lena Horne made her debut here, leading Noble Sissel's orchestra in 1933, after Sissel was injured in an auto accident. Moonlight was redesigned in 1947 with the familiar wrought iron railing and French colonial architecture. Inside, Clyde Trask and Charlie Kerr, Coney's two resident band leaders, provided countless hours of fine entertainment as dancers glided across the highly polished dance floor in Moonlight's romantic atmosphere. General Manager Ed Schott once remarked that his friends seemed to think that all he did was lock the park gate after Labor Day and unlock it again in May. Nothing could have been further from the truth. As soon as the gate swung shut, construction began on additions to be debuted the following season. Constant improvements were added to the park in order to stimulate business and maintain public interest. Cooney added two rides in the 40s that proved so successful that they remained operational until the park's closing. Actually, these two rides were modified from existing structures. In 1942, the final hill of the Cascades was replaced with one higher and steeper, dubbed the Lost River. This ride found renewed enthusiasm with the public. The Clipper never did gain the acceptance of the public. People seemed to find more enjoyment with the Wildcat's steep, tilted first drop as opposed to the Clipper's twisting curves. Thus. 1946 saw the last train racing over the Clippers' tracks. Most of the ride was demolished, leaving intact the lift hill and the final spiral helix. Nine new hills were constructed, and a new ride, the Shooting Star, was born. The star, like the Wildcat, Clipper, and Twister before it, was designed by Herb Schmeck of the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, a company well known for its coasters and hand-carved carousels. The star proved so popular that business at the Wildcat declined. This, along with age and the desperate need of land, caused the demolition of the cat in September of 1964.
The removal of the Wildcat was only one part of the modernization of Coney during the 1960s. New rides, buildings, and facades gave the park a whole new look as the gracious Art Deco atmosphere gave way to a more contemporary appearance. Even with the modernization, Coney traditions remain. One such tradition was treating park patrons to several free acts during the season. One early offering, a Wild West Rodeo performed on Coney's athletic field, entertained thousands with trick riding, roping, and other western stunts. Level fireworks were performed occasionally during the 20s and 30s. This spectacular display in 1929 was staged on the shore of Lake Como. In later years, aerial displays became more common. The Sky Review was a feature on the mall since the early decades under the shot management. Scheduled the last week of August, the Sky Review helped boost attendance during the traditionally slow days. Feats of skill were played out high in the air as spectators lined them all. A ski show was offered on Lake Como each Sunday during the early 60s. It's interesting to note that Lake Como is a man-made lake dug out of a cornfield back in 1893. Like most amusement parks, Coney provided an area especially for the very small children. Early offerings in the latter part of the 20s were such common playground equipment as swings and slides along with other mechanical amusements. This playground was greatly expanded in 1934, bringing to life the land of Oz. Here among Coney's stately shade trees, Younger visitors could enjoy rides much milder than their larger counterparts. For example, the teddy bear coaster was suited to children too small to challenge the mighty wildcat. Yes, Coney Island was definitely a place for children. Unfortunately, not all children. For the first 64 of its 85 years as an amusement park, Coney Island sadly discriminated against blacks. The Autogate was the scene of many demonstrations to desegregate the park in the 1950s. And after years of pressure, Coney opened its gates to blacks for the first time in 1955. Spring floods were a constant threat to Coney Island. Although few caused as much damage as the 1937 flood, they all did their share. At any time during the day or night,
Coney workers were called to the park in order to prepare for yet another flood. As the water rose, rides were tied down with cables or moved to higher ground. The carousel horses were automatically moved to the highest part of Moonlight Gardens at the end of each season. As soon as the flood waters began to recede, pony workers were again called to the park for the cleanup operation. Mud had to be washed back to the river before it dried. Fire hoses were put to this task. Debris was cleared from the site and the damages repaired. Of course, Coney opened faithfully on time. It takes people to run an amusement park, and Coney had some of the very best. Without their love and devotion, it's doubtful that Coney could have achieved its tremendous success. Hundreds of cashiers manned the stands and ticket booths during Coney's history. Primarily made up of school teachers and housewives, the cashiers contributed greatly in the operation of the park. Many would return to work at the park year after year. Two vaudevillians, Hazel Lorraine and Vera Esberger, joined the cashier ranks in the 20s and served the park faithfully summer after summer until their retirement in the mid-60s. They, along with the rest of the cashier force, hold a strong position in the Coney Island story. The rides were under the care of Shirley Watkins, park superintendent. Watkins was well qualified for the job, having worked previously for the Philadelphia Toboggan Company. It is impossible to adequately describe the beauty of Coney Island. Great care was taken to provide patrons with lush greenery and thousands of flowering plants at every turn. Carefully manicured shrubbery lined the walkways through the park. It was not uncommon for people to visit Coney just to sit and admire the grounds while other family members challenged the rides. responsible for creating the floral displays was Henry Schwab, grounds superintendent. Schwab joined the park in the early 20s and gave his own personal touch to the park until his retirement in 1965. Coney Island's beauty was not confined to the daytime. Thousands of lights covered the rides and buildings, glistening as they cut through the darkness. Winter time at the park was also spectacular. Seldom seen by the general public, the park was transformed into a wonderland as a blanket of snow gently embraced the sleeping park.
Like any business offering services to the public, Coney had to advertise in order to entice prospective visitors. Television commercials, brochures, and posters invited people to come on out and join in the fun and excitement at Coney Island. Well, excuse me, madam, I see you're using Hyde. That's right. What do you like most about Hyde? It's power to conceal dirt? I wouldn't say that. The way it gets dirt whiter than white? I wouldn't say that. But what would you say? It saves me time. And what do you do with the time that Hyde saves you? I swim at sunlight pool. Swim in sunlight pool. Keep cool. You can dine. The food is fine. And dance. At Moonlight Garden. Light, swim, dine, and dance. At Cincinnati's Coney yet another look at Coney Island's years as an amusement park. These treasured fragments from the past remain to tell their own unique story.
The largest of all mementos is the hand-carved carousel, now located at King's Island Entertainment Center. Carved in 1927 by the carvers of the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, the carousel survives to bring magic and excitement to future generations. A day at Coney Island can still be enjoyed long after the disappearance of the amusement park. The entertainment provided reflects that of Parker's Grove, giving Cincinnatians a chance to experience those relaxing days of yesteryear, complete with summertime picnics and moonlight strolls along the river. But you know, it's important not to mourn the past, but to celebrate it. Coney Island was and always will be a brilliant, shining gem in the Queen City's crown. The memories provided by a thrilling trip on a shooting star, or by a moonlight serenade at Moonlight Gardens, or by a breezy trip up the Ohio aboard the Island Queen will forever be cherished by hundreds of thousands of men and women who made the trip and were lucky enough to experience the park firsthand. For those of you who experience the park, and for those of you who haven't, our sincerest wish is that we helped you relive the magic that was Cincinnati's Coney Island. After the fireworks now, the roads leading back to Cincinnati will be congested. May we suggest, if you're not in a hurry, that you linger about the park until the traffic congestion is relieved. A few minutes in the park may save you an hour on the road. All riding devices are now in operation. Few amusement parks captured the hearts of so many, as did Cincinnati's Coney Island. A lot of fun, a lot of excitement, a lot of thrills for every member of the entire family. Seems like a hundred years ago, of course, by now. But there was Moonlight Gardens, and the sound of the big bands, dancing, Lake Como. It all added up to a beautiful day. What it really adds up to, though, is some really great memories. <laughs> 